Okay, great. We'll, uh, we'll make a start then. So I'm just going to pick uh, one example in uh, the munging capabilities of H2O to demonstrate that one. Uh, so we're going to pick uh, ordered joining. So what's a H2O frame? It's columnar, has been from the start since H2O was first designed. It's compressed, highly compressed. It's in memory only, and one column of a data frame, a H2O frame in Java can be greater than one node, so there isn't any restriction like that. And it's parallel and it's distributed. Uh, there's a parallel and distributed data loader called h2o.import file. And the API, as you know, is from Python, R, Java, and REST. So R's data table works in a different way to other databases and other packages in that there's no hash table at all. So to join, it uh, orders the left join columns, and then it orders the right join columns, and then it's a binary merge of the two sorted indexes. And sorting is really fast in data table because it's a forwards uh, radix. And so once we've got a sorted index, we can do advanced munging joins, which are ordered joins, which are hard, which are possible to do in SQL, but are harder. So for example, we can join to the prevailing observation, and we could say, give me the, the, the last observation for a particular stock or a particular person on or before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, provided it was within one hour of that time requested. So that's something I needed when I was working as a quant in cash equity research in uh, investment banks like um, Salomon Smith Barney at Citigroup. So that's the kind of logic that I'm used to. And uh, the, the website for the data table package is, is there in the link. But there's a problem with data table, and it's single-threaded, it's single node, and it's limited to 2 billion rows. So I joined h 2 a year ago to parallelize that and distribute that logic and to see how far we could take it. So we've uh, now created an open benchmark. The link is here. All the code is fully reproducible. Uh, we recently hired Jan Gorecki. Uh, so he's uh, working with me now on uh, benchmarking, and we've benchmarked Spark and Impala and, and, in, and compared that to H2O. So we're looking for feedback um, from yourselves and from other uh, software providers. Uh, pull requests are welcome. And we've just started with one very tough test to start with, which is a high cardinality big join, which I'm going to demo and explain exactly what this test is. So the results on one billion rows, rows on nine nodes, our data table is slow, as you imagine, because it's single node and single threaded. Spark 2's next. Uh, what, what these blobs are is the time of the first run, time of the second run, and the time of the third run. So we don't want to report the minimum of a set of runs, because that hides the time of the first run, which might cache uh, the data, and then the minimum would hide the time of the first run. It's, of course, when you're a data scientist or using these databases in production or in research, you only do the task once. So it's the time of the first run that most often is the one you care about. So that's the, the red dot. And H2O is the fastest currently on this tough test, about 20, 30 seconds. And we've used the latest versions of uh, all the software. So what exactly are we testing here? So it's high cardinality. So it's not just the number of rows, but what's in the rows. So 500 uh, stock tickers is what I would call low cardinality. Millions of people, medium cardinality. Billions of devices, high cardinality. And you can also have high cardinality with combinations of low cardinality columns, like ID and date, or ID, date, and time, or more uh, categorical um, columns. So what's the, the data look like in this test? Uh, this is the 10 billion row example. So we have two input tables. On the left and the right are the two tables. Uh, they're both 10 billion rows long with two columns, 200 gigabytes each. So they just each fit on one node, but uh, obviously both of them won't fit on one node, so we distribute them across nine nodes. Uh, the key column is a 10 
uh, up to a 10-digit integer. So I'm sampling, sampling uni from the uniform distribution between 1 and 10 billion. So it's high cardinality. We have a few duplicates. And those are the, the blue duplicates on the right, the orange duplicates on the left. And so we have a, a many-to-one or a one-to-many join here. It's just an inner join. Uh, if it's one-to-one, -one, they come back. If there's no match, nothing comes back in the result. So the result looks like this. We've got the orange key, and the, the value in the Y table is repeated once. So it's a standard SQL inner join. We've done outer join as well, but I'm just, dis just displaying inner join here. And the, the H2O join is ordered, so it brings the keys back in the, in, in, built into the algorithm in, ordered, uh, in, the, in the result, they're ordered. And it's stable, so it keeps the original order of the rows maintained, so it's suitable for time series. And the H2O commands to do this are pretty simple. Uh, I'm just showing the R package here, but the pandas and the Python side is very similar. So library H2O, it's a CRAN package. It's open source, as you know. You initialize a connection to the H2O backend, which is much like connecting to a database. Then you import the file, which is parallel and distributed, uh, the left and the right table. And then once it's in memory, we uh, compute many, many statistics on it over and over again and work with it. And the, the result of the merge currently is the standard R syntax for merge, just with H2O in the beginning, um, with method equals radix, and then we time the, uh, the result. So to see this in action, let's, uh, I'd started it running just before, yeah. So here I'm connected to our, uh, our 10 servers back in Mountain View. Each of these boxes I'm clicking is one of the servers. So the blue means that that's a CPU which isn't active at the moment. All these, hopefully you can see my pointer moving as well. The, all, these, uh, all these lines, these, these red and green CPUs, is IF top running in each of these windows. So we've got 10 of those running so that we can see the network traffic as well as the join um, starts. And so we should see the CPUs light up in green as it starts. And then these columns are the memory usage on each of the boxes. I'm just uh, using a simple command line tool just to monitor the memory there. So if we start the, the join going, uh, that's lazy, so I have to uh, print the, the result. Uh, so it's off, and it's, uh, it's in parallel, as you can see. And if we, uh, if we connect to the, 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 uh, the node and have a look at the log file, we can have a look at uh, what it's doing as it's running. So at the moment, it's building the left index. And you'll notice it's using the network straight away. So this is unlike other algorithms which are sort the pieces and then merge together the pieces. Instead, we split up using the forwards radix, and we, we, split, we send the data soon and use the network very uh, early in the algorithm, and send those parts of the index to the right node. So imagine node 1 getting all the A's and node 2 getting all the B's. So it's now sorting all the A's within the first node and all the B's within the second node, which it's finished, and it's now on the node 9. So it's built the left index. So now we've got an ordered index, which we can uh, use later on, so we can do faster grouping if we're grouping in the same order as the index. And it's ordered, so we can do those advanced joins, like joining to the prevailing observation within a window. And now it's building the right index for the right table. So it's doing the same thing again, using the network, sending the data around. And now it's starting to sort those ordered pieces on each node.
Come on. Nearly finished. So this is what I spend my day in, day out doing, watching these uh, blue and green bars, making it all go green, and making all the black go white, and getting frustrated that this one's been left behind. So can we optimize it more so that it looks more like this? So now it's got the left and the right index on each of the nodes. It's now joining locally the A's on the left table with the A's on the right table, which is, a, uh, again, a fairly straightforward task on each, uh, on each node. And as soon as it's finished each piece, it's then going to start grabbing the data from the other nodes. So at the moment, it's not really using all the CPUs we can see on all the, all the machines. But as soon as the first piece completes, it'll start to communicate with the others, and it should start to fill in and be all, all green. So there we go. Got the first node communicating. So we're trying to use the network throughout the algorithm. So this is going to sit here for another few minutes. The whole join is going to take about six and a half minutes. So if we compare to the, uh, the previous uh, comparison to Spark and Impala, where I showed that H2O was taking 20 or 30 seconds, that was for 1 billion rows. So times 10, it's a little bit more than linear scaling, but it's not too far off. So certainly, um, six minutes is quite a, uh, an achievement, I think, for H2O. It's using the column, the storage, the compressed columns, it's, it's the compressed data transfer between the nodes, and it's utilizing the network and the CPUs at the same time. So any questions as we uh, watch this thing run? There's no Spark in here at all at the moment, no. This is just one JVM process running on each of the nodes. Any more questions? No, it's no, it's all thoroughly random. In fact, the first time we did this 10 billion row join, it came back with 50 billion rows. And I scratched my head for several months thinking there was a problem in the join or the way the many-to-many -many was working. It turned out that the randomness wasn't good enough, and we didn't have enough unique keys. So the Cartesian product was coming back with the duplicates, joining to the duplicates. So now we use the PCG random number, ge number generator rather than the Mersenne twister. And that, uh, that generates unique keys, and uh, the, the result comes back. So it's, base, it's, not, uh, it's just the first step is just sending around the key columns. It's not sending around all the data. Um, it compresses together the com combination of the columns in the key. So although I'm just showing one column here, it's, uh, it's just a simple test, but it does work for three or four or five columns. Uh, so it sends around the key with the original row location, and then once it's, which is quite a, there's not that much data, then once it does the join on the key uh, and the, the row locations, then it goes and fetches the data. So it's a single fetch, and it's all queued internally inside H2O. So there's a, a pool, and the threads are allocated the next piece, so it doesn't naively just go and start up thousands of threads. Any more questions? Yep. What's the numbers in the, in the middle? Oh, it's perf bar. It's perf bar. Okay. So I think uh, Tom, one of our, uh, you saw presenting earlier, he, he wrote it, I think, or he strongly modified it. But if you, there's a repo on uh, GitHub with Tom K's name to it. Um, I think it came from Azure originally, because Azure was one of the first companies to have over 100 cores. So they had this very, very wide perf bar, and then they made it into rows. But uh, yeah, it's, what, it's quite good. It's, uh, it's an average of the CPU over some number of milliseconds. So it kind of pulses like this. But you have to imagine that really the CPUs are kind of bursting underneath. But it's better than uh, HTOP because you can see 
you can see these uh, 320 cores in, in the middle. Any more? Is it finished? No. You can do multiple columns in a key, yeah. And if one side has three columns, you can join to, say, two columns in the other side. You don't have to use all the columns in the key. Yeah, yeah. So I think, is it, uh, oh, I'm looking at the, the log file, and the log file hasn't told me it's completed. So if I go to here, then it has completed, and it's returned uh, just under 10 billion rows. Uh, so we have a look at the, the head. Comes back instantly, and that's, you see that the, the, the smallest keys, uh, this was random data between minus 5 billion and plus 5 billion. So the minus 5 billions have come back, and we need to change that formatting so that it prints out as a big int rather than uh, rounding to numeric. But you have, that's the, the minimum key. Any more questions? Otherwise, that's, uh, that's all I had. Thank you.